Kitty talking about suppressing star formation on the smallest scales. Okay. And is the volume good in the back? Yes? Awesome. Thank you. Um, so first, thank you to the organizers for having me and for putting together this wonderful conference. Um, I am Katie rodriguez Wimberly. I am a grad student at UC Irvine, and today I'll be talking about, um, similar to what Susan was talking about, suppression of star formation, but I am focusing on the smallest of satellite galaxies and specifically looking at the role that environment played in their suppression. So this is work that I did and just submitted the paper um, with my advisor, Mike Cooper, along with um, my other collaborators, Sean Fillingham, Mike boylan Colchin, James Bullock, and Shay Garrison-Kimmel. So this is a big picture of satellite galaxy quenching. So on the left, we have work done by Andrew Wetzel in 2013, um, where he looked at the variances in host mass um, and how that affects the satellite quenching in the larger scales. Coral Wheeler in 2014 looked at starvation. And then Sean Fillingham looked at um, stripping in the classical dwarf range in 2016. And then we get to the smallest satellite ranges. And as you can see, there's not much there. But that's where I come in. Um, so we do know that satellite galaxies exist in these tiny ranges. These are the ultra-faint dwarf galaxies. And in 2014, Tom Brown looked specifically at these six, observing them with um, Hubble and Keck. And he put together these star formation histories, where as you can see, most of them, maybe except for Ursa Major 1, um, formed most of their stars by about redshift of two. So if we talk about just these six and just this picture, this kind of points to reionization as being the main mechanism that quenched the stars, or quenched star formation in these six ultrafaint dwarfs. But if we look at this from a different point of view and look at the phase space and where they live today, we see that they're all kind of nearby the center of um, the Milky Way's dark matter halo. And then comparing this to Miguel Roca's work in 2012, where he looked at the correlation in Via Lactea 2 for um, where subhalos live in phase space today and then correlated that to their infall time, you see that our six ultrafaint dwarfs are consistent with a population of subhalos that fell in a long time ago. This means that environment of the Milky Way's dark matter halo could have had time to um, environmentally quench the star formation in these galaxies. So to further look into this role that environment may have played, I use Elvis. And so this is Shay's um, simulation. I'm using the kind of OG version of Elvis. Um, so just to recap briefly, this is a simulation of 48 Milky Way and Andromeda-like hosts. There are 12 paired runs and 24 isolated runs. So I'm going in and finding all of the, um, some halos where we think ultra-faint dwarf galaxies would live. So my halo mass range is 7.9 to 9.7, and then just everything inside of the virial radius of the host halo. Now, as Shay and like Tyler Kelly had talked about earlier, um, we do know that a disk potential really does affect and destroy some of these subhalos. So to kind of mimic that in a very simple way, um, we took my original population of subhalos and ran it through a prescription where we destroyed some subhalos that come very close to the center of the host halo, or you know, so they have very small paracenters, and we end up, I end up cutting out about 25% of my original population. So now with this trimmed down version. I, oh, sorry, too far, okay. I look at um, infalls of these subhalos. So the two I focus on are the latest infall into the Milky Way 
like Subhalo, and then to focus, to talk about pre-processing, I look at the first infall of one of the subhalos into any um, dark matter halo that would house an SMC-like or greater galaxy. So this is to talk about any environmental pre-processing that may have occurred. And so now what I do is play this game. Um, so taking my cues off of Tom Brown's six ultra-faint dwarf galaxies, I go through my population and I randomly select six subhalos of 10,000 times and I calculate the probability that all six had fallen in by a given redshift. So on the vertical axis, we have the probability of environmental quenching, which is very similar. We're talking about um, accretion, but I'm kind of parroting the two. And then redshift on the or time and redshift on the vertical. And so as you can see, when we look at the, actually both, but specifically the um, last Milky Way infall, there's a vanishingly small probability that environment could have quenched all six of the randomly selected subhalos so that they would be what we observe, which is having um, stellar populations that are greater than 10 giga years old. So this is kind of pointing to the fact that environment did not play a big role in quenching these star formations. Um, but we know that there are more than six ultrafaint dwarfs. So here are Tom Brown's six again. And around the same time, Dan Wise was doing similar work. And so I can add um, four more ultrafaint dwarfs that are around the Milky Way that have star formation histories. And so now I have a population of 10. And there's been many others found and observed. And so here are most of the confirmed ultrafaint dwarf galaxies around the Milky Way. Um, this comes, many of these come from the um, Dark Energy Survey. And this is only some of them again. Um, there's many more that are candidates, so we need further observations to determine whether it's a galaxy or a globular cluster. And then, as has been mentioned previously in the conference, many more to be found still. So I'm going to take this now a little more robust observational information and add it to the games that I was playing where instead of just looking for six randomly selected halos, I push it out and look for 10 and then 20. And as you can see, every time our population of pretty ancient um, ultra-faint dwarf galaxies grows, so does the increasingly vanishingly small probability that the environment could have quenched their uh, star formation. But going with the conservative route, we can say that there is a less than 0.1% chance that uh, environment quenched our ultra-faint dwarf galaxies. So just to push this a little bit, um, I wanted to look at, to be a little more conservative, and say instead of requiring the entire sample of ultra-faint dwarf galaxies to be quenched, I'm just going to require that 75% have fallen in by that given redshift. And so as you can see, in the gray, brand, gray band, I have um, the spread from an n equals 6 group all the way to an n equals 20 group. And this increases the probability a little bit, but not by much. And the last point that I looked at was these kind of unique ultra-faint dwarfs. Um, so for example, Airy 2. So Eridanus 2 lives about right at the virial radius of where we think the Milky Way's dark matter halo is. Um, so even playing the same game where I'm selecting just one ultra-faint dwarf galaxy that looks uh, like Eridanus II in the Elvis simulations, there's a 10% chance that it was environmentally quenched. But having this population of six that are close by that we know have ancient stellar populations still provides a, a better constraint to um, the mechanism that quenched the star formation. So we're going to leave that and still stick with this 0.1% uh, probability. And now the last thing, if we had a truly isolated field dwarf galaxy, ultra-faint dwarf galaxy that had just ancient stars in it, then we could say this is not re uh, environment that quenched it because it hasn't been an environment. Um, we haven't seen that yet, but... In Elvis, there's about 250 predicted that we could see around the local group. Um, so hopefully in the future we'll find these. 
but I will say that there is about 49% of that 250 that are expected to be black splash. So they were once inside the Milky Way's halo and have come back out. So again, with that, we can really say that it is um, very, very unlikely that environment played a role in quenching the star formation of the ultra-faint dwarf galaxies. And so I can add a little bit to this big picture of satellite galaxy quenching and say that it is most likely reionization because it's probably not environment. Thank you. Questions? Um, like if there is, if I have more destruction of the subhalos. Mm -hmm. Oh no! So so before Elvis, there was no disruption. I added a little disruption to to be more physical, I guess. So does that? Yeah, does that answer the question? Kind of. Okay. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Another question? If not, let's thank okay. Katia again. Thank you.